Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. I think the 7th Councilmanic District in Manhattan is the longest, narrowest, and most diverse district in the borough. It includes Washington Heights, Hamilton Heights, Manhattanville, Morningside Heights, Manhattan Valley, and the northern part of the Upper West Side. Mark Levine skillfully represents it, and he's my guest today. Welcome. Thank you, Ronnie. So is it the most diverse district in Manhattan? It is. And Maybe one the, in the city? And one of the most diverse in the city, and that makes it really a wonderful district to represent. But difficult in a way. It is challenging, but there are common issues that touch everyone. It's an overwhelmingly right. yeah. rental district, and tenants are facing pressure from the northern end to the southern end and everywhere in between by rising rents and uh, landlords which are pushing people out. Which is a really serious problem in the whole city everywhere, right? I mean, as people get priced out of one place and they discover these little hidden pockets, which one is the most? Hamilton Heights? There's, uh, uh, there's upward pressure in every part of the district. People have, uh, who've been priced out of uh, the core of the west side are often moving 40 yeah. or 50 blocks north. Washington, uh, but Washington Heights has a whole artistic, cultural little... Not it has, it has a, a, a vibrant uh, scene of artists and musicians mm -hmm. and others, and it always has. It's mm -hmm. been an incredible part of its tradition, as does West Harlem. It's been mm -hmm. home, to, home to legends like Count Basie and many others. Yeah, the whole district, actually. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Yes. And you have institutional expansion. You've got yes. major institutions in those. We have many. Uh, Columbia is, of course, uh, busy building a massive new campus on the western end of 125th mm -hmm. Street. And that's changed the character of the surrounding neighborhood, uh, where people are already moving in, expecting that they'll be nearby uh, the yeah. new campus, professors, yeah. students, and others. Uh -huh. And then you have the hospital? We have St. Luke's Hospital, which is in the district, oh, which, is, is. which is also the... in a period of transition. It's so does been... that, that oh, right, that's the other side of Columbia, right? That's right. It's, uh -huh. been, it's now part of the Mount Sinai system, mm -hmm. and, and Sinai has been repositioning each of the, I think, eight campuses in the network. Uh, and expanding and shrinking some services at St. Luke's. And St. Luke's is also in the midst of a sale of four of its historic buildings. Oh, really? Uh, which are going to be developed for housing. But they can't be changed. They're, they're already landmarked? Two of the four are landmarked. Uh, so we've got assurances from the developer that all four will be preserved. Um, but it, it appears it's going to be entirely luxury housing. And so we, we regret that there won't be affordable units in this development. And then what about, um, do you go over far enough to have a morning, a morning side up at City College? I have uh, a little piece of the main City College campus and all the surrounding blocks. That's really the heart of Hamilton Heights, uh, some of the most beautiful streets, brownstones uh, in the city, uh, historic um, home ownership, um, but also a neighborhood where prices are rising rapidly and people are being pushed out. How, how many older people do you have in the district? I mean, that's the, that's the key, isn't it? When people... Do you mean age-wise, like yeah, senior yeah, citizens? Yeah, yeah. Uh, large percent of 65 and over. Right. Uh, don't know the exact percentage. So when they, when, when they disappear, I don't mean to sound crass, but when they're old and they've lived there for a long time and then they, dis they go, those apartments can go to market rate? Right. Look, the reality is that um, landlords have loopholes that allows them to take almost any vacant unit to market rate. And that has put pressure for pushing Incredible out long-time tenants because landlords know they can double or triple the rent if they can vacate the unit. And it means that uh, the neighborhood is slowly becoming unaffordable for anyone new who's working class, uh, low income, or even middle class. And the children of long-time families are often moving away. Uh, perhaps if they make it uh, economically into the middle class, they'll go to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Those who are still struggling tend to go to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. But it's changing the character of uptown, mm -hmm. uh, and it's bringing real hardship to families looking for housing. It's, um, you, you've come, you're a big supporter of providing legal services to people in family court. Does, do you also find that landlords are trying to buy people out, and that poor people think that like three or $4,000 is a big deal, there, and there they is, leave? There's an aggressive move to buy people out. There's actually an industry of what they call euphemistically tenant relocation specialists who put a lot of pressure on tenants who often take buyouts under duress um, and take amounts which might at first glance look impressive, 10000 15000 but really it's not enough to replace a home. 
you can't, it's no down payment. You wouldn't be able to pay market rate rent for more than a few months. But it's connected to the issue ju you just m mentioned, which is what's happening in housing court, yeah. um, where we had 150,000 housing court actions in the city last year, uh, eviction cases. Mm -hmm. And landlords know that usually the tenant will not have an attorney. Almost all landlords do. So incredibly unequal balance. So they're often hauling tenants into housing court on fairly shaky grounds, but knowing that if the tenant doesn't have legal representation, they might just be intimidated and midway through the proceedings take a buyout at an unfavorable rate. And that's happening. Tens of thousands of people a year, we believe, are, are exiting their homes in the midst of eviction proceedings. And then in the end, uh, the court's mandating now close to 30,000 evictions a year. Terrible human cost. It's been increasing steadily. And it is feeding our homeless crisis. Uh, homelessness today is not primarily a matter of single men. Uh, Two-thirds of the people in our shelters are families. Forty percent are children. That's almost 25,000 children. The total shelter population is about 57 or 58,000. And the single largest cause of family homelessness is not drug addiction. It's not mental health issues. It's eviction. If we could stop the eviction epidemic, we would decrease homelessness in this city. And it's the reason why I've worked very hard to build support for a right to counsel in housing court. We actually have legislation on this, intro 214. And is it going to pass? We hope so. We have 38 <laughs> sponsors. You know from your days in the council that you don't get that many sponsors too often. We've had over 1,000 pieces of, of legislation introduced so far this term. I think less than 10 have that many uh, co-sponsors. And we've made tremendous progress while we're working on the legislation towards getting more money to this. Yeah. Uh, back three fiscal years ago, the city was putting about $6 million a year towards representation in housing court for tenants. Now uh, we're up to close to $60 million. Uh, the mayor's put a lot of money into this, the city council as well. Uh, that's going to touch thousands of families. Uh, it's still going to leave the vast majority of tenants without representation, so we have a long way to go. And ultimately, we believe this should be declared as a right because we don't want to be subject to the whims of politics. Uh, we may have a less progressive leadership in the future, and we don't want to be subject to the ups and downs of the economy. Right now, the budget is fairly healthy. That won't last forever. We want a right declared so that every tenant, at least low-income tenants, know going into housing court, they're going to be represented. And this, by the way, is fiscally prudent because we're spending as much as 40000 a year per family in the homeless system, in the homeless shelters. And not, not including the cost. That's such an experience. Oh, well, the human it's cost a... itself is, is tremendous. Yeah. But even the financial cost, it's not only the homeless shelters, where the average stays over a year now for families. We're spending about 40000 a year per family. And families also move back, they find, right? Into their homes? No, they, when they get an apartment... The recidivism rate, if that's a, an, a, you know, a, a, the kind of term to use, they come back because if they can't continue to pay that rent. Oh, I, yes. Yeah, today, there was an article today about the increase in homelessness, and one of the things they said was there was a high rate of families coming back into the system. Well, for sure. Once a family loses a rent-regulated apartment it's, they, they, after, and they wind up in a homeless shelter, they may cycle out. But they're once again going to be subjected yeah. to the challenges of market rate housing and may land back in. I mean, ultimately, homelessness in New York City is a result of an economic crisis. It's the result of the mismatch, mismatch between wages and rents. And part of our work has to also be increasing wages through increasing the minimum wage and giving people the skills to move forward in the job market. Um, but we just can't ignore the imbalance in housing court. And it's one of the best strategies to prevent it. But it's another, it, I mean, it's more than just the difference between wages and, and the cost of living. It, it seems to me it's the never-ending, uh, I don't know how to say it, um, of the real estate people, of wanting to make more and more money. I wonder if Bernie Sanders, who says he's a democratic socialist, is this the kind of thing he's talking about? Would he come in with some kind of, if, if there was someone like him, I know that, that the mayor would like to be like him, but uh, would he come up with proposals that would 
be different as far as rent protections, do you think? Well, if, if you were mayor of New York City, he just might. Yeah. Uh, I think that the, the current mayor and the city council uh, believe strongly in tenant protections, but f- unfortunately, much of this is in the hands of Albany. Yeah. And we there, just went through. Uh, the, the landlord lobby has a very strong grip on the Republican uh, Senate. Uh, incredible that in a state which is almost two to one Democratic, the Republicans still control that chamber, but they do. And it's made it very, very hard to move any pro tenant legislation. There's more the city can do and more that the city must do, but our fate is not entirely in our own hands. Yeah. And, and by the way, just, just to mention that this is not only a problem for residents, it's a problem for businesses. Well, I was going to come into that. That's another area that you're very interested in, right? Yes, you can see it on almost any street you walk down in Manhattan now where the turnover, the loss of small businesses is accelerating. Uh, and it means mom and pop stores, cleaners, diners, flower shops, um, they're disappearing and in are coming tenants, typically chains, that can pay very, very high rents. And that's because as weak as protections are for residential tenants in New York City, there's almost nothing for commercial tenants. When your lease is up, if you rent a store, when your lease is up, you are entirely at the whim of the landlord. Right. And he can double the rent. Double, triple, triple quintuple the rent. Wants. Or even simply say, sorry, we're not going to renew a lease to you on any time. And it's a direct parallel. It goes along with raising... Uh, residential rents because it means people with more money are moving in so the owner of the store thinks he can make more money from the store owner right? from the uh, renter uh, yeah. indeed um, and that's not a new problem because i remember when i was in the council which was late in the late 1900s i mean 1990s and ruth messenger had been there in the 80s right. commercial rent control was always an issue we could right. never find a way to do right. it Right. There is some good legislation now that would establish a protocol when the lease is up for mediation or or even um, binding arbitration that we think would level the playing field for commercial tenants. There's also more we have to do to fight harassment of commercial tenants. Again, we talk a lot about this in the residential context, Mm. but um, Mm. Councilman Cornegie, Robert Cornegie, who chairs the Small Business Committee, and I have a bill that would... Uh, impose sanctions on landlords that are doing things like uh, shutting off the heat at inconvenient times that make it difficult to run a business, performing <laughs> unnecessary construction that disrupts a business. Um, there's all sorts of ways that landlords are attempting to push commercial tenants out during the term of their lease. Oh. We talked about how bad it is when the lease is up. Yeah. Some of these leases, though, are 10, 15, 20 years, and landlords in some cases say, I don't want to wait that long. I want to push the tenant out out now and they're engaging in very very aggressive tactics and we need more legal protections and more sanctions and the other thing is we i watch in our neighborhood they'd rather have the store empty than renew the lease of the earlier tenant it's just an amazing but you know all of this comes it it's it's a ripple it's a domino effect i mean in the central area manhattan midtown where all of these luxury and downtown luxury apartment buildings the condos that are selling for millions and millions of dollars that are being bought a lot of by foreign owners right. who are just parking their cash here. It, that starts this ripple, it seems to me. Indeed, and what's happening on 57th Street is particularly distressing. Yeah. You know, I chair the Parks Committee, yeah. and I'm very concerned about the shadows that are going to be cast by this yes, emerging definitely. forest of super, sky, super tall skyscrapers just south of the park. And this is housing which is not helping hardly any actual New Yorkers. Uh, Perhaps if it was affordable housing, we'd feel differently about it. These are super large units, penthouses taking up four floors with one oligarch from another country who may actually not spend any time there uh, buying it for investment purposes or as a trophy. Uh, And paying no income taxes because he's not working here. Right. This is a problem. Uh, and, and in the case of the first tower to go up on 57th Street, right. they got an exemption. That's uh, so incredible, the tax exemption. Which, which is indefensible. Uh, we certainly shouldn't be subsidizing this. But I think we should be limiting the height of those buildings to take account of the shadows they're projecting on the mm. park below uh, and for other reasons. But uh, Central Park thrives right now because it does have so much sunlight. And in the winter months, it's almost impossible to be in the park in the shade. And more and more buildings are going to be, unfortunately, expanding the shadow on the park. And do we find, we don't find that so much going up 
Central Park West and Fifth Avenue for less, a while. Less because... Northern, though, right? No, right. Well, f- from the north, almost none. Mm-hmm. L- less <clears throat> on the east and west because the sun generally shines from the south. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and those towers around 57th Street are unfortunately um, positioned so that they're going to cast the maximum shadow. During the afternoon hours, which is when kids are coming to the park, and these shadows are now over a mile long. Think about how far that reaches into the park. And if it were just one tower, okay, you wait for the shadow to pass. But when it's a dozen towers, and there are about a dozen towers that are yeah. on some stage of production or financing, then it really becomes, in effect, a wall. Uh, and that's going to change the park forever. The tower's not going anywhere. They're going to be there for 200 years. And it's going to change, uh, experts tell us, potentially the ecology of parts of the park that are, go- that are going to be in shadow most of right. the day. And just the usability of a park which is beloved and enjoyed by millions of New Yorkers. As the chairman of the Parks Committee, uh, I guess one of your goals is to uh, be sure that almost every neighborhood has some green and a place it is. to sit quietly, right? It is. Look, I think of parks as so much more than just about a pretty landscape. I think they are critical to the health of every neighborhood. Mm-hmm. They promote public safety. They promote our physical health. They're good for the environment. They're great for community building. Every neighborhood deserves and needs a great park. We have 1,700 parks in the city. But the reality is we have a two-tiered financing system where about a dozen or so parks get uh, a significant amount of private money, uh, including Central Park. And that's wonderful for Central Park. I hope they continue to receive that (laughs) financing. But the rest of the system, the hundreds of other neighborhood parks, rely only on the city for their budget. And that money has stagnated over the years. Going back into the 60s, we used to give 1.5% of our park budget, of our city budget to parks. Today, we only devote one half of 1% of our city's budget to parks. And that's less than most other big cities in America. Uh, We're underfunding our parks by almost any objective measure. And that means that when you go to places like the South Bronx, you see neighborhood parks with broken pavement and water fountains that don't work, uh, basketball courts with no hoops, and other indications of, of lack of financing. So we've pushed very, very hard in the Parks Committee to restore the parks budget so that every neighborhood can have a thriving park, uh, which it deserves. To me, this is really an equity issue. Uh, sometimes you hear people say, well, we can either focus as a city on equity issues or quality of life issues. I often think that there is no, no difference. Is there? Certainly in parks, there isn't. Yeah, yeah. Where every neighborhood wants to have the great quality of life that comes with a healthy park. And there's a strong equity component because it is sadly the outlying neighborhoods of the city which have not gotten the investment they deserve. Are parks at all included in uh, the mayor's housing program? I mean, instead of giving taxes, benefits, or some other thing, uh, is it the community boards and the communities that negotiate with a developer to improve a park? Well, it's so important that in the neighborhoods we're upzoning, and six have been announced so far, uh, East New York, East Harlem, uh, Jerome Avenue in the Bronx, Mm. and we believe a total of 15 will ultimately be upzoned. With the thousands of new people coming into those neighborhoods, it's critical that we think about open space Mm -hmm. and green space. And that hasn't always been done in the past in the city, and we don't want to make that mistake now. We want there to be just as much parkland per resident in those neighborhoods as we enjoy in other parts of the city. Um, the, the mayor has certainly spoken about this issue and has devoted some resources to it. Um, I'm not sure if we have quite enough money in the budget for acquisition of new parkland, which is going to have to be part of the solution uh, in neighborhoods where there's not a lot of city-owned property to easily tap. Developers, uh, in some cases, can and should pay for acquisition and development of new park land. Um, whoever does it, we've got to make sure it happens. This has got to be built into every plan, uh, and I'm going to be advocating for you this very strongly. Do you think you'll be successful? I hope so. <laughs> We're at early days on these upzonings, up um, so it's too soon to know, but I'm optimistic. Good for you. Now, let me, <laughs> it's always nice to have an optimistic chair. It's always nice to have a, a time, too, when you feel that you have the opportunity to do it. Right? You've got the leadership. You have a new council, we do. basically. We do. Which is, makes such a difference. Uh, the funny thing is, I've been watching them in Washington with the Republican caucuses. 
in a way, the, um, the whatever we call them, it's not called Tea Party anymore, they're asking for the same kind of ref what we consider terrible, bad things that are going to contribute to the malfunctioning of the Congress. They're similar to the reforms that have been made in the city council, right? It's true. Uh, the council <laughs> is probably one of the more open legislative bodies in America at any level at this point. And that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and it's not really about left or right, necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's, it's about the ability giving for members to rank and file members the chance to do the work that their mm -hmm. constituents have sent them to City Hall to do. Uh, it's become a body where um, even the newest member of the council can actually work on legislation and see it rise to the top yeah. through committee yeah. and through a vote on the floor. Uh, and it's not a place where people feel fearful of speaking their mind. Uh, because there'd be repercussions. Uh, I know that in your day, uh, a member who stood anything. up <laughs> could lose their committee chairship, could even be stripped of membership of a committee, uh, could lose discretionary money. And that, in effect, punished districts who might have lost resources mm -hmm. for uh, a council member who simply stood up for their beliefs and maybe was just only advocating for the yeah, district. Yeah. We've had a reform to the way discretionary money is distributed, it used to be almost entirely at the whim of the speaker. That was clearly a very powerful tool for keeping dis discipline. Yeah. But now it's formulaic so that uh, roughly everyone gets an even base. And there's actually a premium offered for lower income districts as well as should. My district is one of the beneficiaries of that That's because lucky. it is lower income. <laughs> yeah, uh, you need it. But, but that way it's, it's transparent. Everyone knows how much money is going per district. Uh, it removes the mystery, but it also... It, it keeps discretionary money from being used as a, a weapon, really, to keep members in line. We have about two minutes, and I want to talk about you. Okay. You were a school teacher. My first job out of college, I taught bilingual math and science at a junior high school in the South Bronx. Now, you're fluent in Spanish. I am, yes. Which is very good, because we only talked about the economic diversity in your district. Uh, there's a large percentage. What's my, the percentage? My district is uh, about 45% Latino about 19% African-American, about 5% Asian, about 25% or so white. So it's about as district as a community can be. So, as a, as and you're representing them, which is really interesting. I am. Look, I campaigned <laughs> as much in Spanish as English and continue yeah. to do so today. Uh, How did, where did you learn Spanish? I lived in Spain, and I was the only American in a physics department at the University of Seville with 800 students. Oh. So I learned Spanish very quickly, and then when I came back, to America. I was a teacher in the Bronx. I was a bilingual teacher, uh, so uh, I spoke Spanish very quickly. The kids, who were mostly from the Caribbean, um, uh, beat my Sicilian accent out of me. I mean, uh, um, my Spanish accent out of me. And uh, today I probably sound more like a Puerto Rican or a Cuban. When I'm on the radio, I'm often asked uh, what island I'm from. <laughs> That's so interesting. I, I usually say the island of Manhattan. Now, I'm not saying this in a bad way at all, but you are a very good in addition to being a very far-sighted and, and uh, progressive legislator, you're, you move around very well in pol politics. I mean, here you are in the midst of a district that you really normally would not have somebody like you representing it. You have your own political club. I do, You yes, manage to stay out of a lot of the other politics in other communities. Is that how you do it? Or well, you go beyond them? Or you, I, you envelop them, you embrace them? I don't know. How do you do it? Well, look, <laughs> politics in New York can often uh, descend into pretty nasty parochial fights. Mm -hmm. I've tried to stay above that where I can. Um, but we've built a great progressive reform club, the Barack Obama Democratic Club of Upper Manhattan, which uh, has been a force in everything from presidential to mayoral to uh, city council campaigns. And we're really proud of the club we've built. And it's, it's been a great platform for me to uh, support progressive candidates at all levels. It's also one of the most diverse clubs you'll find anywhere, almost equal parts African-American, Latino, and white. So rare to see that. But we've come together around uh, progressive ideals, and I think it's done great for the community, and I'm really proud of that work. And do you still, as a former teacher, are you, I would assume you're still very interested in education and Deep, the way the city Deeply interested does it. as a former New York City public school teacher, also as a current New York City public school parent and a member of the Education Committee and the Council. 
uh, because probably the area of policy that we in local government most, most directly touch. And so uh, I've spent a tremendous amount of time on it. And, uh, we could have a whole other program on it, right? We could easily do a whole show on it. I would, I would love that discussion. <laughs> but you are, are natural for the job you have. Well, I don't know about that, <laughs> but I certainly love it. It's been almost two years. It's been an incredible experience. Uh, I've learned so much. Uh, I feel like we've done great work on the legislative front and great work in our community. Um, still two years to go in this term, but uh, I'm lucky to get up every day and look forward to what I do, and not everyone can say that. That's so great, absolutely. Are you now in for, are you in office for eight years? We have two four-year terms. Uh, if I'm lucky enough to be reelected, I'll get a second four-year term. Uh, term limits uh, a maximum of two terms. Weird quirk in the council where uh, the class before us has three terms, and we only have two. Yeah. Uh, be that as it may, eight years, if I'm lucky enough to have that long, uh, <laughs> certainly would be a, a true privilege. And then we'll her. have to find out where you go. Next. That, that'll be a topic of another show as well. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much, Mark Levine. Ronnie, I'm and real congratulations pleasure. to your district of having elected such a good uh, representative. Thank you, and thank you for having thank me. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear or topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.